In 1994, the Dallas Mavericks assembled one of the NBA's most exciting young cores. By 1997, all of them were gone. The disbanding of the Mavericks is usually blamed on a love triangle involving pop star Tony Braxton. But that explanation isn't really accurate. And either way, it's not the whole story. Not even close. The 93 Mavericks were a disaster. What does the Taco and the Mavs have in common? They're both getting beat on tonight. Management had traded one of their best veterans, fired the coach, and failed to reach a contract agreement with their exciting rookie wing, Jim Jackson, who held out and refused to play until March. When Jackson finally debuted, Dallas kind of sort of rallied and finished with 11 wins. Worst in the NBA, but not quite the worst record ever. Congrats, Mavs. They ended up picking fourth in the 93 draft and grabbed Jamal Mashburn, a Kentucky Wildcat who got tons of buckets from the wing positions, just like Jackson. It takes a very savvy coach to develop two young, headstrong scorers into a functional tandem. So the Mavs handed the reins to a rookie, Quinn Buckner, who wanted his team to play the notoriously rigid triangle offense and who espoused a disciplinarian approach like his college coach, Bob Knight. Friends, it was a mess, like such a f-ing mess. When the Mavs started poorly, everyone blamed the coach, including the kids. Jackson said the triangle took away all his creativity. Mashburn had been in the league for like two months, but he was piling on Buckner too. Buckner eventually benched Mashburn, who turned up his nose at the ball being put in Jackson's hands and reminded everyone that he was good in college partly because he had a coach who respected him. Those are incredibly bold quotes from a rookie, but the sophomore did him one better. Jackson came very close to fighting Coach Buckner, like physically. And I'm sitting in the towel with ice bags on. And Quinn walked by and says to him, he said, well, if you got something to say to me, say it to my, and it got kind of heated and they had to break us up. So yeah, the Mavs were bad. Their record was three and 40 at one point. They finished with 13 wins, which, hey, that's worse than the NBA, but it's an improvement over 11 wins. While the Dallas Cowboys, with their own young core, were inaugurating a dynasty, the city's basketball team was truly a laughingstock. And a toxic, losing environment didn't exactly help Mashburn and Jackson get along. Later reports said each guy complained about the other one hogging the ball to pad his stats. So Dallas entered the 94-95 season with a fresh start. Kind of. Dick Mata had been the team's first ever coach in the 80s, and they brought the sharp-tongued 64-year-old out of retirement to make this group work. And with yet another lottery pick, they brought in yet another rookie with star potential, brilliant Cal point guard Jason Kidd. Jim, Jamal, Jason. A delightfully consonant trio of young guns. They were dubbed Triple J Ranch and marketed accordingly. The Mavs started hot, and the incumbents felt much better about their new situation. A hell of a lot better than they did the previous year. With Mata freeing up the offense and Kidd distributing the ball, both Jackson and Mashburn had 50-point games. 50 puntos. 49 for Mashburn, and there is 50. Dallas's record improved considerably from the historic lows of the prior years, but they were still a losing team. And there were signs of fraying. There's a story that in a game against the Jazz, Kidd hit a couple shots in a row out of isolation post-ups, but asked the coaches not to run that play anymore because he thought Jackson and Mashburn didn't like him scoring so much. And something interesting happened in February, when Jackson's season ended because of an ankle injury. The Mavs improved. A lot. Kidd commanded the ball, Mashburn took over the scoring, and sounded thrilled about it. And Dallas posted a winning record in March and April. They climbed up the standings almost into the playoffs. Jackson's return then was kind of a problem. He was healthy for the start of the 95-96 season, but his relationship with Mashburn was not. Jackson felt Mashburn had commandeered too much of the scoring responsibility in his absence, and the grudge got so bad by mid-November that Coach Mata demanded they have a conciliatory meeting. Jim and Jamal came out of that meeting insisting they'd solved their problems, but when someone mentioned that to Mata a month later, he said, I guess if there could be peace in the Golan Heights and peace in Belfast, anything's possible, which I, I just don't feel like you're helping, Coach Mata. On the court, the rift between Mashburn and Jackson solved itself when injuries ended Mashburn's season in December. But they continued to quarrel off the court, and the youngest of the three Jays was fed up. Kidd even hinted that he might want to break up. He was emerging as the best of the three players, so why not get his own boat instead of foundering in theirs? Jackson's response was icy, but still boat-oriented. Props for sticking with the analogy, Jim. So now Jim had beef with Jason and it surfaced on the court when Jackson hogged the ball. 
And yeah, you guessed it, the Mavs were still losing. They were playing pretty futuristic basketball, setting several three-point records, but they were injured and they were beefing, so they lost just the same. Rumors started to swirl. Jackson and Kidd denied reports that they were feuding over a woman. Things were getting out of hand, so it was time for another meeting. Mavs owner Don Carter commanded Jackson and Kidd to sit down and settle their differences. Carter was in the process of selling the team to a group led by Ross Perot Jr., so I imagine it was important for the negotiations that players at least appear to be on good terms with each other. And by all accounts at the time, Jackson and Kidd squashed the beef. Dick Mata hopped up on a chair in front of reporters to pronounce the feud dead. It wasn't. If there was a truce, it broke on April 25th, when Kidd witnessed Jackson berating Scotty Brooks for not passing him the ball. Right as team ownership was changing hands, Kidd demanded a trade of him, of Jackson, whatever it took to break off a rough corner of the Triple J Ranch triumvirate. New ownership was hoping a coaching change would soothe things, and they brought in Jim Clements, an assistant from Phil Jackson's Bulls. Kidd was excited, but no. He still wanted a separation from Jackson, and Mashburn had his back. Coach Clemens insisted he could make it work, but the arrival of even more rumors ensured that would never, ever be the case. Okay, if you had any prior knowledge of this beef, you knew we were building to this point. The story I'm about to tell you is not true, or at least mostly not true. Here we go. In late 1995, the Mavericks were in Atlanta to face the Hawks. Up and coming pop superstar Tony Braxton was also in Atlanta where she lived. Kid arranged to go on a date with Braxton, when Braxton arrived in a limo to pick Kid up, Jackson was there waiting instead, and he went on a date with Tony Braxton. Kid got mad, and thus there was beef. Again, nothing I just told you is true, and I'm really sorry I lied. I feel bad about that. Jim Jackson says the story isn't true. Jason Kidd says it's not true. Jamal Mashburn says it's not true. Let's talk about what is true, according to the people involved. Jackson says the Mavericks arranged in November of 95 to meet Braxton at a studio in New York, not Atlanta. It was sort of a team field trip, but neither Jackson nor Kidd ended up going. And years later, Dick Mata told reporters that Jim and Jason did indeed clash over matters involving women. So if we're taking everyone at their word, you can see how unscrupulous rumor mongers may have connected several facts to form a falsehood. And when confronted with the rumors in a radio interview, Braxton was sort of playfully vague. Maybe she'd met Jackson and or Kidd, but she wasn't the type to kiss and tell. Listen, I am not here to besmirch the good name of Tony Braxton, but she did have an album coming out, appropriately titled Secrets. It may have been in her best interests, publicity-wise, to play along with a rumor that she knew to be false. For her, it was harmless. For Triple J Ranch, it was not harmless. By somebody saying something and misinterpreting what happened, it sparked like that. They already had multiple beeves and a trade demand, and now they spent every day denying reports of a love triangle. But Mav's leadership was in flux, so they didn't do anything. Dallas entered the 96-97 season with the trio somehow still intact under Clemens. And surprise, they sucked and everyone was a huge mess. Being a Phil Jackson disciple, Clemens ran the triangle offense, and just like before, everyone hated it. Mashburn kept suffering injuries. Kids' shots weren't falling and he started skipping practices. Various agents and representatives played a part, and Jackson was still there, playing through unstoppable rumors that he'd stolen Kid's celebrity date, which didn't make anyone happy. So Dallas blew it up. The day after Christmas, 1996, the Mavs traded Kid to the Phoenix Suns. In February, Don Nelson took over as Mavs GM and within days traded Mashburn to the Heat, then Jackson to the Nets. Nelson would soon become head coach and help turn the Mavs into a contender. And the three Jays? They each had fine careers of their own, separately and distinctly. Kidd became one of the best point guards ever and even returned to Dallas and won a ring. The Triple Jays are all on friendly terms now and feel regret over the way things went. Their story is a lesson for any NBA team, any workplace really. You can't just throw a bunch of up and coming hotshots together and expect it to work. Young talents need to be understood. They need to be fostered, cared for. They need to not be drafted into a fucking train wreck of bad management and a new coach every year. Instead of growing a functional team, the Mavs grew beef, so much beef, out of control beef, inaccurate rumors about beef. Dick Mata said it best. The three J's fell victim to a fourth J, jealousy. Just maybe not exactly the jealousy we thought. Who knew? 
The rumors about Tony Braxton aren't true. Are the rumors about Tony Braxton and me true? Who's to say? If you liked the video, leave a comment, share it with your friends, and subscribe to all the things that need subscribing to.